Hello and welcome my friends to Weird Mythic Podcast. Oh my gosh, it's been what, two, almost a little over maybe two weeks since I have recorded or uploaded a new episode. So I don't want to apologize for any, you know, anybody wondering why I haven't put anything out or what the deal is. Honestly, I just had a lot of shit going on. <laughs> uh, a lot of good stuff, actually. Um, maybe some new changes coming to my life career wise and just getting my personal life, you know, to where I want it to be. So still navigating that. But I was just really busy and something fun. Also, I went to like multiple concerts. Uh, I finally got to see the Interrupters. Oh my gosh. If you guys don't know who the Interrupters are, punk ska band been around for 10 years amy the lead singer is fucking amazing i knew that this was going to be like my favorite concert of the concert season i just knew it when i bought the tickets and i they didn't disappoint they sound amazing all the energy interaction with the crowd uh this is one of the first times that i've been able to get into a mosh pit not like in it but you know i'm the person on the outside pushing everybody back into it people running into me me pushing them back <laughs> i haven't done that in a minute and it was just so much fun great people in the crowd and the, the band just sounds amazing live they are just one of those bands that just kills it and brings their a game no matter what so concerts awesome bands and i got to spend like four days in fort bragg that's here in northern california right on the coast kind of near mendocino for those of you who don't know where fort bragg california is because i know there's another fort bragg on the east coast somewhere but fort bragg is one of those places that i've been going to since i was a kid it's like our quote unquote vacation spot it's not a vacation spot people uh you go there and you go to like either uh, uh, an RV park area or a tent camp area. Lots of tent camping growing up there on every single one of the little campsites that are all along the coast right there. I've stayed at probably every single one in the town. And I went with my mom, my brother, his three children. And of course, I brought along my girl, Christina. We just had a blast. Got really really drunk that first night like normal we always get wasted the first night in fort bragg because we're so excited to be there and then the next day we went to every single you know beach and rocks that my nieces and nephew could climb on and they just had a blast getting into that freezing cold freaking water <laughs> like i don't like i was there with my mom and mom always took us growing up and so did dad and they were always so like how can you get in that water? It is so cold. And it's not like it's 90 degrees. It's coastal weather over there and not hot. It's not like LA, San Diego. It is colder up here, wind blowing. But I know as a kid, I always got in that ocean when just seeing my nieces and nephew do the same thing was hilarious. They were covered in salty water and sand and got it all over my car. <laughs> but it was, it was just a great place to relax get your mind right, just sit there, listen to the ocean, smoke a little bit, drink a little bit, and just chill. And it was great. And I hadn't seen my mom in about a year. And it was just perfect timing for her to come up at this time because me and Christina already had it planned to go up there. I was like, mom's coming along. Mom, don't pay nothing. Just get in my car. Let's go. So <laughs> I know she came up here to visit friends and other family members, but I just took her to the fort to Fort Bragg and hung out with me instead. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's like the many reasons I haven't been posting and recording, but I got to get back into it. I need to give consistency. I need to show, you know, that I am in this and that I like doing the show. It's so much fun. But, you know, sometimes you just got to say, fuck it and take a break. This is a passion project and I can kind of push it to the side at times, but that's not going to be like a regular thing. I'm going to get back to posting once a week. So I do apologize about that if anybody's been wondering what the hell's been going on again. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to get back into it. Speaking of getting back into it, I still want to recommend Live Laugh Larceny podcast. Check them out. They will make your day. I have a link to them in the show notes. They're the ones that do the petty crime and then a little bit of, you know, jokes and whatnot and banter back and forth. But it's all about petty crime. And it, like I said, it's like Walmart people in Florida, men all coming together. It's freaking hilarious. 
Live Laugh Larceny. Please check them out. Great people. Hilarious. Well, let's get into it, shall we? So let's start today's episode with a place that I haven't been inside of it, but I have passed by it and walked around the flower gardens before. I'm going to be talking about the Grey Whale Inn. The reason I'm going to talk about the Grey Whale Inn is because it's haunted. I haven't done a haunted episode in a while. And it's in one of my favorite places ever, Fort Bragg, California. And since I was there, I got to see it again. Unfortunately, there is no more rose garden or, or flower garden, but I was able to go walk around it before. So the Great Well Inn is in Fort Bragg, and it was originally built by the Union Labor Company. And they were building the first hospital in that part of Northern California for Fort Bragg. There's a lot of loggers up there, and it was called the Gray Well Hospital. And they built it in 1915 and then was sold to another company in 1923 and renamed Redwood Hospital, which had patients until about 1971. And then in 1978, it was converted into an inn slash uh, B&B. And yeah, that's what it was doing from the 78 till just about 2019, 2020 when COVID hit and the gray well was then sold to a other person who does not have it as an inn or a B&B. And unfortunately, it is laying vacant at this time. So there's all the boringness about how it used to be a hospital, hospital, now an inn, and now it's vacant. So the Gray Well Inn. Something also to keep in mind that since it was built and the money came from the Union Labor Company in the late 1800s when they were logging as much redwoods as they could, the Native American Indians lived there. And the loggers did not give a shit about the fact that they were destroying the land of the natives that they were living on. So the Indians were forced to move to a reservation, then forced to move to another reservation three years later. And all this was done by the Union Labor Company. And one of the reasons why they were forced away from their homes was just for profit. They were just destroying the land. So they were forced to move. And unfortunately, the loggers ended up killing natives because in the, in the late 1800s, the government was still really trying to get rid of Native Americans. And they were putting things out there saying to scalp them, you'll get money for it. So people were still doing that in this part of California, even in the late 1800s. So keep that in mind that the Union Labor Company in this part of Fort Bragg, a lot of that was still going on right before the Graywell Inn, the Graywell Hospital, the Redwood Hospital was in operation. Something that the labor company also did was steal food from the Native Americans so that they would starve. They would also kidnap their children and force them into labor. All of that money that came from the Union Labor Company went to the Graywell Inn, which was before the hospital. So I just had to put it out there that it wasn't the best area for Native Americans and they were still taking their land, forcing them to move, starving them out, and then they built a hospital. All of that was from the same company. So let's just get into the paranormal shit already. <laughs> All right. So I've always been told that the Graywell Inn was haunted and that there are ghosts living in the building, which makes sense now that we all know the history behind the building and the fact that it was a hospital for over 60 years. That's a lot of death. Well, not always all death, but usually hospitals, there's death in there. This was one of the first hospitals to promote women to give birth in a hospital, not have at home births. This hospital was also one of the first with 50 beds that were specifically meant for surgery that was approved by the American College of Surgeons. So it was kind of a big deal. As a bed and breakfast in 1971, there's four stories with 14 rooms. So there was always the four stories because it was a hospital, but they made 14 rooms out of this hospital into a bed and breakfast. There's also a basement and this basement is fucking huge, guys. It's as long as the building itself. It's just giant. And by the 1980s is when reports started to come in that there were ghosts at the Gray Well. Most reports were about a woman who is a bit transparent and is seen at night looking at flowers in the pictures in the hallway. 
Other reports are of an older man who you can see from the outside of the building. So like you're walking around the flower garden that was there and you look up and you see this old man just peering at you through the curtains when there is nobody up there. They would have these reports day and night. It didn't happen at certain hours or certain times of day. It happened randomly throughout the day and night. And most who reported the paranormal experience are kind of along the lines of, quote, like, it was just us and another family slash couple on the second floor. But I know there must have been another family, another couple upstairs because I could hear them walking around at night. Loosely quotes there, guys. It was the more like, you know, I know it was just us there on the second floor and there was that other couple down the hallway but I swear I heard footsteps all night coming from above us, but there was no reason for that because there's no one else in the building. Employees of the Gray Whale have not reported like full body apparitions like that of the customers, but they do hear lots of unusual things and just have those icky feelings when sometimes walking into rooms or being up there at night. want to know, does anybody watch any of those like celebrity ghost stories because if you have because i have and i've seen a few of them and they're actually really cool i I like hearing people's experiences uh but yeah so celebrity ghost stories if you don't know the show check it out there's another show with the same celebrities from celebrity ghost stories but it's called the haunting of and it's about celebrity paranormal experiences but the show goes to the locations of where the haunting or the experience actually took place i've never watched this show So I had to for this episode because on episode, what is it? Episode 12, season two, The Haunting of is at the Greywell Inn. Now the host, her name is Kim Russo, who is a psychic medium and the one with the paranormal experiences in the show. His name is D.B. Sweeney. I didn't know who this actor was, guys. No fucking clue. Sorry, D.B. Sweeney. I don't know who you are, but I looked you up on IMDb. DD or ID, what you know, the movie site. <laughs> Notice that he was from Spawn, which is cool. I fucking love Spawn. I still don't know who the guy is, but he was also a voiceover actor. He's also a voiceover actor and he played a character in Brother Bear. Don't know who the character was, but I do know the movie. Anyway, DB Sweeney and his friend Brian had the experience in the early 2000s. So let me go ahead and get into that experience again. The season is season two, episode 12, if you want to watch it yourself. D.B. Sweeney and his buddy Brian were writing a horror movie in the early 2000s, and they wanted to kind of get some, get into like the zone and go to a creepy place so that they can kind of, you know, get into the zone and write about creepy things in a creepy place. They definitely weren't looking to have a paranormal experiences. They just wanted to go to a, whatever a haunted location was. Neither of them have been to Fort Bragg and they were just kind of driving along the coast and noticed the Greywell Inn and it looked creepy from the outside, which honestly kind of gives you a little eerie bit of a feeling, which I sure is just for the fact that it used to be a hospital and is now a and b and you're wondering what's up with architecture. But anyways, DB and Brian go to the Greywell. They get one night, no, nothing weird going on. They go up to their room which I think was on the second or third floor. And the first thing they notice when they get to their room is as soon as they close the door that there are seven locks on the door. Seven. Deadbolts, everything. Which I agree is very strange that a hotel or a B&B would have seven different types of locks on the inside. Something that they did notice is that the curtains were completely closed. And these are big, heavy curtains. So they settle, start writing, and start brainstorming when they notice the curtains were open. No biggie, right? DB thought it was odd. Brian thought it was odd because neither of them actually got up to open the curtains. And neither of them saw the other person get up to open the curtains. So DB got up and closed them. But just a few minutes later, the curtains were all of a sudden open again. Both men looking at each other like, I know I didn't see you move them, but you must be fucking with me. (laughs) So like I they they just thought it was strange. They know they closed it and DB decided to take a chair this time, put it against the curtains while they were closed 
That way, they really can be opened again. The night goes on and both men are done for their day and end up falling asleep. But DB does have to get up at one point to use the bathroom. When he comes out of the bathroom, the curtains were wide open. Like straight up wide open, not even a crack, just wide open. And the chair that he placed there to leave the curtains in place was still in the same spot. Now, DB was like, whatever, Brian, asshole, joking, whatever. So he closes the curtains for a third time and then goes back to bed. The next morning, as both men are getting ready for the day, getting dressed, DB's brushing his teeth, comes out of the bathroom. And when he does, he he's coming out of the bathroom and he looks to where the curtains are. And as he looks at the curtains, he sees an old, mad and snarling, his word, snarling woman facing him. And this woman looked very upset. And DB just yells at Brian, do you see her? Brian, without hesitation, yells back, I see her. Both men are like seeing this woman looking at each other. And then all of a sudden she disappeared. Almost as soon as she appeared to them, she disappeared. DB and Brian grabbed their things, left the room with the quickness. Neither man could explain to the other what had just happened and what they had just witnessed. Both men were already skeptics. And although DB had this experience, he was still a skeptic after, but they were both more willing to learn and more curious about paranormal experiences. So very strange curtains opening, seeing a a woman you can kind of see through and just disappearing. Like she didn't yell. She just looked mad and just like a mad dog kind of creeped them out though. Let's fast forward to out of the early 2000s to May of 2012. This is when Kim Russo and the hauntings of team met up with DB and Brian at the Greywell Inn to investigate. Now, I know I have a show about cryptids, aliens, paranormal, whatnot, but I am sort of skeptical. I'm very skeptical on anyone who claims to be a medium for profit, I think is my main issue. I've met one, one medium my entire life that I believe is truly a medium. And you guys know her. It's V, Vanessa from Life Paranormal with V. Now, girl, I believe you you are tapped into something. And that is just because of the interactions I've had with you and what you have said to me about certain things. Now, at first, I will admit, I don't know you. I never talked to you before when we first uh, talked over when we were doing the show together. Uh, But by the end of it, and after doing the past life experience thing, girl, you've tapped into something and I believe you. So Kim Russo for The Hauntings Of, I was straight up skeptic, like this girl's just trying to get ratings or famous somehow. So just, yeah. So getting, so watching that, I was totally skeptical just right off the bat. So let's just get back into the hauntings of, so the hauntings of team did not tell Kim where she was going. Didn't tell her anything about DB and Brian's experience at the Greywell Inn. She's never been to Fort Bragg, California either. And the entire ride to the Grey Well was very interesting for Kim, to say the, the least. On the way to the end, Kim gets images of a sad woman and many others in her head. She starts to question, quote, where are you taking me, unquote. Like she's getting a lot of people coming to her from the paranormal realm, from the other side, as they are heading to the gray well. And she's really like, who are these people? Where are we going? So Kim gets to the gray well before DB and Brian. When she gets out of the car, she merely knew that the inn was not originally a bed and breakfast. And she believed something happened on the roof of the building. The outside of the inn has a huge flower garden in 2012. She says that the outside of the inn does not match the feeling that she is getting about the building itself. Kim starts to walk around the the outside of the inn, starts to get feelings of someone watching her from inside the building and has a heaviness on her chest. Around that time, DB shows up. This is the first time that she is meeting him. This is where 
DB tells her, I wasn't here. This is the second time I've only been here. I only stayed here that night. And they were, you know, he was going there to get inspiration for his movie. And as DB is like introducing himself and telling him how him and Brian got to the gray well, Kim is, quote, joined by a spirit. So DB is talking and Kim kind of just stops him. And she tells DB that she is joined by his dad. But Kim doesn't believe that the spirit is immediately DB's dad. So she actually starts to question, and it's all in her head, however she does it, she starts to question this person coming to her. And as she's questioning the spirit, he starts to talk about DB's daughter. And so Kim relates that to DB and starts saying, he's saying this about your daughter, he's saying this. And DB is like, no, that sounds like my dad. And just to watch how that happened with Kim getting those psychic tellings from the other side and then not believing it and then asking questions to the spirit and then bringing those questions to DB and letting DB know exactly what they're saying was really cool to watch. Kim also just, you know, is sitting there trying to figure out who all these spirits are as she's talking to DB. Is Are they all DB's family? Is Are they from the inn? She's not sure at this point. And a little bit after that, Brian shows up and Kim starts asking Brian, did you have a brother named John? And Brian is just now meeting this woman and was like, yes. And DB has never mentioned anything about Brian's family either. But Brian then tells Kim, but he passed away a long time ago when he was born. It was like right after birth that he passed away. And Kim was getting something from the other side, from the paranormal realm that just kept bugging her about Brian's brother, John. All three of them are there together, and now it's time to go into the Gray Well Inn. Now, once inside the Gray Well, Kim gets a vision of a woman and tells Brian that she is with Brian's mother, Brian's aunts, and his brother who passed away as a child. Again, Kim has no idea about Brian's family. She then asks Brian that, like asks Brian was his mom named Eileen and if she happened to play the piano and Brian honestly his eyes widen he's like well yes her name was Eileen she didn't play the piano though but she used to play the organ at the church and he's like getting a little bit overwhelmed about the accuracy that Kim just has about this knowledge and she's just getting a lot of Brian's family coming to her and some of DB is like as soon as she walks into the hotel As all three of them decide to walk around, they go up to the roof first. Kim explains what is going on in her head as she's getting to the roof. And when they're on the roof, she says that the visitors that are coming to her, or the, uh, sorry, the visions that are coming to her kept saying the name William, but neither man knew a William. So Kim just, okay, whatever, and just goes on to what else is coming into her head. And she then starts to ask DB about his dad, if he was a teacher or a principal at a school. And DB then tells her, well, he wasn't a principal or a teacher, but he was a guidance counselor for a high school up until he retired. And as they're on the roof, Kim is getting that name, William, William, back in her head. And William tells Kim, this guy, William, who's in her head, that he remembers DB and Brian the night they stayed there. So there's just a bunch of things coming to Kim and she's just trying to work it out at this point. So they're on the roof. They decide to move into the basement. Once entering the basement, DB says out loud, quote, the air feels heavy in here, unquote. Kim agrees and says she's actually glad that DB said something because he's now becoming more open to these paranormal experiences, which she likes. (laughs) In the basement, Kim hears a woman sobbing and repeating, my baby, my baby. Kim does not feel the presence of a baby in that room, but she does have that woman and and she hears the crying in the basement. And DB then tells Kim that their experiences with the woman that they had was upstairs in a room. So that's when they decide to go to the room. Once they are on the third floor, Kim gets the feeling that that floor was the delivery or the maternity ward. Just the feeling that she gets. So they enter her room. 
All three of them go into the room where DB and Brian had their experience. And the door now has seven plus locks on. I think they said it's like nine or ten on there now. Which is still just freaking weird. But something they knew was different besides how many locks are on there was now there's two peepholes on the door. I agree with all three of these guys that like, yeah, that's weird. Two peepholes and seven plus locks. What are you doing at this hotel that you need that to happen? <laughs> Once they are in that room, that is when DB and Brian tell their experience to Kim. Kim says that the woman she heard crying in the basement is now in the room with them as they're retelling that story. Kim's visions are telling her that the woman died while giving birth, that the woman didn't know if her baby had lived or not. Kim believes the child passed away after being born, and the woman is still looking for that baby. Kim also believes that she is the woman the men saw that day in their room. As Kim is making these connections with the woman in the room, she's also finding connections between the woman and Brian's mom, who had the baby pass away during childbirth. Kim then starts to ask Brian and DB's families to help the woman pass over to the other side. And she's telling the spirit to move on and then asking the families of the, the spirits to kind of guide her. But she doesn't know where the baby is, unfortunately. So that's kind of what happens when they're there. Brian does leave the show fairly early. And Kim does say that she helped the mo woman move on from the gray well. And then Kim and DB kind of have a sit down talk about their experiences together. Now, Kim believes that spirits are more gravitated to those who are skeptical which I actually disagree with. I believe that if you're more open to paranormal experiences and more open to the paranormal world and the other side, then you will have more experiences or encounters. Now, for those who are skeptical and have a paranormal experience, I believe it was just a good timing at that point or bad timing, depending on what they think it is, or just at times when the veil is very thin between our world and theirs. Uh, that's just my opinion, though. Whatever, right? So remember when Kim was having those visions and that name William kept coming at her and neither of them knew a William. So come to find out in 1909, there was a William at that hospital who jumped off the roof. Mm hmm. Yep. When it was still a hospital. There's also a report from 1918 of a woman who passed away during childbirth and the child also passed away. Not saying it's the woman they saw, but it is very interesting that a man named William and a woman, you know, and it just clock, it just it matches what they were saying. So this, this haunting of was a really fun show to watch. And after watching it, I straight up believe that Kim is a legit psychic. It re I really, it was just the interactions and the things she was asking and then Everything that just came out of it. I, I do believe that she's tapped into something also. I do have a link to that show in the show notes if you would like to watch it yourself as well. So what else about the gray and right? I did find a blog from a married couple from a married couple <laughs> who went to the Gray Well Inn in 2018. They didn't really have a paranormal experience at the Gray Well Inn, but as I kept like reading and it was getting toward the end of their blog. I feel like something did happen to them, though. I believe the husband actually got sick from the house. Both of them were looking for paranormal experiences, so they had, like, EVPs and other paranormal hunting equipment with them. They spent a lot of time in the basement, like, hours in the basement, and that's where the husband started to feel sick, and he says it it kind of came out of nowhere. And the the wife, he, she didn't get sick at all and stayed down in the basement for a little bit longer and never had the same sickness or icky feelings that he did they did however like go to these other places in fort bragg this is why it's a really cool blog and it'll be in the show notes also but they went to other places in fort bragg that had other hauntings and they went to this place that has a residual haunting which was from a murder that was done like in mid 2000s these three men murdered this man on the side of the road for like less than 200 bucks in his car 
And ever since that happened, people have been saying that they see a man just kind of wander in the side of the road, appears and disappears. So they did go there, but they did ca- catch those killers, by the way. The murderers, they, they got him behind, got them behind bars. But um, the other thing that happened to this couple when they were at the Gray Well Inn is, like I said, it, like the husband got sick. But there was at one point where the wife said it sounded like there could have been people upstairs, but both of them were under the impression that there was nobody else at the inn. So really cool blog just to give you some paranormal stuff about the town of Fort Bragg. And of course, I did have to go to YouTube because I wanted to watch some things. <laughs> and I really didn't find much like things I didn't already know about the gray whale. So of course, I went to look at the comments. And there's this one comment from just about five years ago on one of the ones that I'll post. And they stayed or she stayed at the Gray Well Inn. And this is what she had to say in her quote in her comment. So quote, the ghosts are all nice. One was a nurse who delivered children and is most often reported reported standing vigil over sleeping guests and reassuring pets on their legs and shoulders. More often than not, it's the pregnant guests. I have heard about a male ghost there. there, I have heard about a male ghost, but none of the locals ever reference him. Just the kind of woman in the window, unquote. So she's saying they're nice ghosts and it's just a woman who's happy to see pregnant chicks. (laughs) I also wanted to like see if there was anything on like travel websites, which I couldn't really find. However, I did find a cool Yelp review. It's really good story. So there is this family who stayed at the Gray Well in 2009. They had twin boys and a mo- it was a t- twin boys and a mom and dad. They were bringing stuff into the room and the boys decided to go to the basement because the basement, there's like a pool, there's a pool table, foosball, games, and a TV. So the boys went down to the basement while the parents were carrying all the luggage up to the room. The boys just scared themselves in the basement for whatever reason. They were down there playing and then they said they just got spooked and ran. It was a really heavy rain day, which does happen a lot when you go to Fort Bragg. You're thinking it's not going to rain, dude, and it comes down pouring. So it was one of those times where it was just pouring rain. They go out to dinner around 730 and come back. And one of the twins is looking at the pictures of the wall and then notices that the inn used to be a hospital. They then kind of walk around the halls, just checking the place out, like being a family, just walking around. They go to look at some of the old VHS tapes. Now, this inn, even in 2009, didn't really have any DVDs. It was just the type of hotel it was. They kept VHSs and those type of TVs. So they went to look at the VHSs, and the boys decided to watch 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Go back to their room. The rain is pouring, and there is a huge storm So 10 o'clock rolls around and the VHS tape or the player starts to kind of mess up and it starts to get like that fuzzy white and gray stuff all over it. Kind of like ants on the screen, I guess, is the only way I could describe it. So the boys turn off the TV since it was annoying. And almost immediately after turning off the VHS, one of the twin asks the other, what's that noise? Now, to them, it sounded like an organ was playing. The other twin did acknowledge the noise and jumped into bed to fall asleep. Like, they did not want to talk about the noise they were hearing. Both boys were able to pass out. The next morning, they were getting ready for the day, and their mom asks, Was one of you boys standing next to me last night? Both of the boys ask, What do you mean, Mom? Mom then goes on to say that in the middle of the night, She felt like somebody was watching her sleep, but she couldn't see anybody in the room. And it was so dark. She thought maybe one of the boys like snuck in and like just stared at the parents and then left. But she called for both the boys and there was nothing. So she just thought it was strange. So that's a really cool one. I like that one. You know, it's a little strange. Like, like you could just say it could have been anything, could be nothing. Maybe they were hearing somebody else's TV and not an organ or piano being played. Maybe the mom was just having some sort of night terror going on and just had that icky feeling. Another Yelp review. And this is like one out of 40 reviews that 
was like a one star. And this person is just a flat out whiner. So in 2017, there was a couple who went and they just bad mouthed the whole inn. Like just it was a shitty place, bad customer service, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you're one out of 40 reviews saying this. Okay. Anyways, what I wanted to mention is they didn't have paranormal experiences, but at one point when the man was downstairs talking to whoever downstairs, the woman locked herself inside the bathroom because there's a lock on the outside and the inside and the latch to the outside of the bathroom was totally locked. So she couldn't get out at all and had to wait for the dude to come back to the room. And I guess he was down there for a long time. <laughs> so she was stuck in the bathroom for a hell of uh. There's another Google review that I liked, and it's from a Shamise Best. And it's from about five years ago also. And she says that it's a beautiful historic inn. It's close to the beaches and the skunk train. Look it up. Skunk train's not gross, okay? It's just what they call it. It has a beautiful view, which it does. It's four stories. You can see the whole freaking town, I'm sure, and the ocean from there. They have quiet rooms, comfortable beds. But she says it's a very strong paranormal activity for sure. Hauntingly captivating. Two thumbs up. <laughs> that was a good one, too. It really, like, the inn had all kinds of good reviews. So I really wish I had the chance to stay at the Grey Whale when it was still a bed and breakfast or an inn. But after 2019... It was bought and then turned into like this vegan cooking school that didn't go anywhere and was immediately sold again, like in 2020, to this new owner who is wanting to turn the gray well into like a rehab for military vets, which all power to you. But it's been three years and nothing has come of it. And it's just sitting vacant. I did find an article from 2019, I think it might have been 2020. But the locals in Fort Bragg are not happy about this new owner of the Gray Whale. And I'm going to post like this article I found that is just like talking shit about this new owner and how much the locals just don't like him. But I kind of understand this place used to bring in money and visitors and now it's sitting vacant. Although I wasn't able to stay at the Gray Whale Inn, my brother stayed in it in 2019 when it was bought for that new owner who's wanting to make it into a place for military vets. And he didn't really have any paranormal experiences. However, he did get to go into the basement and he took some really cool photos and he sent those to me. So I will be posting those on Instagram. And although he didn't have a paranormal experience, he did tell me that like, so he went there to like build some boxes and some uh, like I, I think he was doing stuff for the cabinets at that time. Anyways, he was only there with two other people who are a lot older than him. And so like my brother, like got some beer, went to the ocean because it's within walking distance of glass beach from where the gray well is. So that's exactly what he did. He got some beers, went to the ocean, enjoyed his night, goes back to the gray well. And the owner, the guy who owns it now told my brother, it's just you guys staying here for the night. So you could choose whatever room you want. So my brother goes all the way up to the fourth floor and walks into whatever room and notices that there's a TV on, looks over at the bed and there's somebody in the bed. So my brother like quietly does a oh shit moment, closes the door, chooses the next room, goes back to sleep. Now I'm not saying that's a paranormal experience because say the TV was on and you never know, maybe there's somebody came in while he was over at the beach, but just something strange. So is the Grey Well Inn haunted? Possibly. There are a lot of stories and a lot of sightings. So I'd say yes to paranormal activity. I don't think it's haunted. Maybe it's more of like residual hauntings or like a place where people can go from our world to the next. But I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. So I got two stories for you this time. Since I was, you know, not having anything for a few weeks. I wanted to make this one long. So I hope you guys are ready for another few, like, I don't know how long, just get over it. <laughs> Anyways, let's get into our next story. And it's not a haunting. It's not a paranormal thing. And I am dedicating this part of the podcast, this episode to my girl, Christina, because she wanted me to cover something on 
incest. And mainly because she's been doing a lot of stuff or like watching a lot of movies and reading books about old England and incest, how that was something practiced back then. And she's like, why? How many other people did this? What other types of countries did this? So she wanted me to do some research on it. Now, to be honest, I didn't want to do an episode on incest. Maybe some other time, but it kind of creeps me out and it makes me angry sometimes because all the science behind it and why would you do that to children but whatever whatever not my place to say so but this part of the show is going to be dedicated to her because when she was talking about that it reminded me of a story and this story is about Sonny Bean and his family now Alexander Sonny Bean was in Scotland in the 16th century his dad was a ditch digger and that was pretty much what his family did however Sonny was known to be lazy and he didn't want to do hard manual labor and really just didn't want to work at all. At some point, at some point, Sonny did meet a woman and marry her. Her name was Black Agnes Douglas. She did not have the best reputation in the town and was accused of being a witch multiple times. So both of them together kind of made a good match. She was lazy. She was a witch. They got along. They weren't really liked in the town by themselves. Now they're really not that well liked at all as a couple. Needing a place to live, they went looking for somewhere with solitude and they came across a cave. This cave is located between Girvan and Bellatre, Scotland, England. It's, it's, uh, I had to Google map it. And it's about 15 miles between each of those towns, Girvan and Beltre. It's located on the west side of Scotland, facing the east of Ireland. So it's right there. You could see, I don't know if you could see it, but Ireland is right on the other side. So 15 miles between the towns, facing the ocean. Plus, this cave, not only was it huge, but during high tide, The path leading into the cave would actually be flooded. So the cave would still be dry, but you couldn't get out, but also nobody could get into the cave. And as I said, this was huge. It was 200 yards deep, which for those who use the metric system is 180 meters. I did have to do the American thing though. I needed to compare it to a football field, which is 100 yards. So for those of of us who like to compare things to football fields, this is two football fields worth of cave, okay? So Sonny and Black Agnes, they didn't have jobs. They needed to make some money so they could eat, right? Sonny started to rob and steal from travelers going by. He would wait for them on the road and then ambush them, take all that they could or take all that he could from them and then take it all back to his cave. But he really wasn't getting enough money for him and his wife to live on. Black Agnes was also pregnant at the time and Sonny decided that not only was he just going to start robbing and stealing from the travelers, but he was going to start killing them as well. He would kill them then bring their bodies back to the cave where he and Black Agnes would dismember the victims and then eat them. Yeah, cannibals. Sonny and Black Agnes had six daughters and eight sons. The children and their parents would go out together attack and ambush their travelers, kill them, take their belongings, along with the bodies back to the cave to be eaten. They were also known for pickling body parts. Yeah. So cannibalism. It's already wrong and it's gross, let alone taboo to the max, am I right? So keeping that in mind, that... Sonny and Black Agnes were outcasts. They didn't leave their cave, except to just steal and murder. Their children didn't have any interaction outside of the cave and outside of the family, which led to the six daughters and eight sons to start having relationships with each other and having incest babies. And out of the 14 children, they had 32 incest grandchildren. There's now 48 people living in that cave. 48 people ambushing and murdering and cannibalizing travelers. Locals in the areas between Gervin and Bellatre 
did notice many people disappearing or going missing. It started, sort of started a witch hunt, actually, and people started to blame the innkeepers, since the innkeepers were usually the last ones to see the missing people. There was also lots of reports of body parts washing, us, uh, washing on shore. So how was the Sawney clan caught? There was one night, there was a fair, and there was a couple who was coming home from the fair. They were on their horse, having a good time, going home, and the Sawney clan ambushed them. He was able to drag the woman from the horse, where they disemboweled her right there on the spot. The man and woman were screaming for help. The man was fighting for his life. Legit fighting for his life. After seeing somebody disembowel your partner, you are freaking the fuck out. Like, no. So he was actually holding his own against the family. There was another group of people not far behind them who heard the couple screaming for help and rushed to them. They were able to save the man, but nobody caught anybody from the Sawney family that night. And then after that incident, they, something had to be done. People gathered together and was like, we got to stop this. This was insane. After the attack, even King James VI got involved. He ordered a search party of 400 men, along with hella bloodhounds, to go look in the areas to see if they can't find something. A group of men and some hounds were able to find the cave and went inside after the Sawney family. Now, according to those men who entered the cave, they saw the family with human remains all around them. Body parts on walls, body parts in barrels, body parts ready to be pickled, along with some that were already pickled. And they had like piles of clothes and jewelry and even money from their victims. The Sawney family was then taken. And after the law and everyone had learned about how the Sawney family would dismember and eat their victims, they didn't even bother with a trial. I figured that execution from the get-go was what needed to be done. So since the Sawnees did such horrible things to their victims, whoever decided to, to execute them decided to do what they did to their victims. Minus the cannibalism, that is. Now this part is going to get a little graphic, guys. So here it goes. So the Sawnee men had their genitals cut off along with their arms, their legs, and then left there to suffer, to bleed out. They didn't kill them immediately. They had them suffer. The women were then forced to watch the men bleed out, watch them be tortured, and bleed to death in front of them. After the women witnessed that, they were taken to, the, to be tied to stakes and burnt alive along with any children of the Sani family, were also on stakes and burnt alive. The story of Sani being and his family first appeared in a tabloid that was active from the 18th to 19th century called the Newsgate Calendar. It's unable to find the specific article, but I am going to post another link that tells you about the article also. It is a real uh, tabloid, though, or was a real tabloid. According to the reports of the Sawney family, they cannibalized over 1,000 people in a span of 25 years. 25 years of being in that cave, murdering and cannibalizing. There was one rumor, though, one rumor that went around of one of the Sawney girls that left the family and went to Gerva. But once it was found out who she was related to, that girl was then murdered. Now, many historians don't 100% believe the story of Sonny Bean and his family just because there's lack of evidence. But who's to say it didn't happen? Because I found that, like, there was another cannibal in sort of the same area in the year 1341. His name was Christy Cleek. He also waited along busy streets and highways where travelers went. He would then attack his victims, take his cleek, which I had to Google because I didn't know what a cleek was, and it is a long pole with a sharp hook at the end. He would take the pole and pull people from their horses or carriages and then rob them and kill them. He did then admit that when times were hard and maybe he just didn't have the money or 
couldn't find the means of getting food, he ate some of his victims. So, I mean, it all, it happened. Happened there. There's plenty of evidence. And he was, like, arrested and then tried for whatever. I don't know if the Sani family could go a whole 25 years worth of of this happening. But I, I'd say it's pretty possible. I don't know, man. I really question if Sani and his wife, Black Agnes, planned like, was this their plan when they got married, having children, and then allowing those children to procreate together? They knew that was wrong. Like, they knew incest wasn't good and shouldn't be practiced, but they allowed it to happen. And, it, I mean, both of them were already murderous cannibals, so maybe they didn't think that their children committing incest was too far off. But it's fucking crazy. I don't know cannibal incest babies i don't know it's gross it's weird i just uh so yeah but let me know what you guys think about the sani bean family uh if you got any extra info on that i've i've always i've known about that story for a long time and really like to know what you guys think about that maybe there's other stories of cannibals from that part of the of that part of the world like in england scotland ireland i don't know let me know what you guys think let me know what you guys think about the Great Well Inn. Do you think it's haunted? Do you think it's just residual hauntings? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe even the Sonny Bean family could have been a cautionary tale for something that I'm unaware of. Help a sister out. <laughs> Go to all of my social media for anything about the Great Well or the Sonny Bean family, which is my social media's all Weird Mythic Podcast on Twitter, Weird Mythic Podcast on Instagram, which I will have all kinds of pictures and there's also a link to my link tree that goes to all my other stuff. Go to Weird Mythic Podcast on YouTube. Go ahead and look the little emblem and listen to me talk that way. <laughs> and please send me anything you got about the show. Send me anything you got about life. Send me anything paranormal, cryptid, strange things, something. Send it to me at weirdmythicpodcast at gmail.com. See ya.